like 10, 16 now, so keeping us on schedule, I'm gonna just get started. I'm Andrew Mung, I'm a third year PhD student in the Walters Lab at the University of Kansas, and I'm gonna to talk today about uh, looking for evidence of selection in dimorphic sperm in Lepidoptera. So, Lepidoptera, of course, are the butterflies and moths, and almost all males, uh, or males of almost all of the species in this order have some really weird reproductive biology going on. They produce two types of sperm. Um, both what we might think of as normal fertilizing sperm, uh, or eupyrene sperm, and the second, uh, anucleated cell type. Uh, we also call it apyrene sperm. It lacks any nuclear DNA, so obviously it can't fertilize eggs, but it's produced under strict hormonal control, and males transfer 10 to 20 times as much of this anucleated sperm as nucleated sperm when they mate with females. So, it pretty clearly has some role in reproduction, uh, although what that is isn't really clear. And my dissertation in general sort of focuses on trying to understand this dimorphism and what the role of anucleated sperm might be. Uh, today we're gonna come at that from a very specific angle, we're gonna put on our molecular evolution hats and look at sort of different selection pressures that might be affecting the two cell types. Because one of the uh, hypothesized goals of the iron sperm is that they're involved in sperm competition. Uh, so to do this, we need a volunteer, and that's the monarch butterfly here. Uh, everybody's favorite butterfly, it's the state insect of like seven states or something. Uh, but for our purposes, we like it because it has a lot of good bioinformatic resources. Um, you can see the list there. Probably most important for us is the fact that it's one of two Lepidoptera for which we have a sperm proteomic data set, um, which looks something like this. So it's about 750 proteins total between the two cell types, um, a lot of which are shared. But there's also a good 300 or so that are unique to the nucleated set, and then another 61 or so that are unique to the anucleated or apyrene set. So, uh, for this talk, we're going to sort of do the gestalt whole sperm proteome comparison against the genome background first, uh, and then see if we can say anything zooming into these two unique sets, uh, and see if we can see for differences in selective pressures between the two there. Um, so, talking about reproductive proteins and molecular evolution might make you think of a classic figure like this. Uh, we see time and again in animals that reproductive proteins tend to diverge more quickly than the genomic background, um, as evidenced by this higher rate of non stop substitution. And a lot of times when we see this result, it's sort of either implicitly or explicitly implied that. This is due to selection of some sort of that. It's sexual conflict or something about speciation. Either way, that this rate of non synonymous change is driven by adaptation and positive selection. But that um, is one possibility, and certainly not the only one. So it's a great paper that came out last year, a theory by Dapper and Wade, that makes us sort of step back and reevaluate this. So. Here we're still considering um, divergence, and we'll start by just any pair of species um, looking at uninteresting things, I'll call them, uh, they call them constitutively expressed. These are things expressed in both sexes, not involved in reproduction. So there's gonna be some level of divergence. Uh, as good nearly neutral theorists, we're thinking that it's not going to be so high, as most change is going to be disfavored, so divergence doesn't immediately crazy, it just sort of slowly takes along. Um, but as nearly neutral theorists, we're also thinking that selection's efficiency is going to depend on population size, so that it's stronger in large populations and drift becomes more important in smaller populations. Well, if we then consider things that are sex-specific in their expression, so say male-limited in expression, what you're doing there is you're effectively having the population size in which these uh, alleles are exposed to selection. 
So we might actually see this uptick in divergence, but rather than due to selection, it's kind of the opposite. It's this relaxation of selection um, and an increased role in drift here. And we can sort of further compound this um, if we're thinking about sperm competition. These are our alleles that are obviously male limited in expression, but then also only relevant in the context where females are mating with more than one male. So that's this x-axis here is sort of female remating rate. And we see that if females rarely remate, uh, sperm competition alleles are almost never under selection and can diverge quite quickly compared to the genome macro. Um, now, this sort of logical framework makes for nice, um, easy predictions about what we might see in the sperm proteome, uh, provided we know what the mating system looks like for our system, which we do. Uh, so monarch butterflies are actually some of the most polyandrous butterflies that have been observed so far. Um, note that this is the harmonic mean, so two to three on the harmonic mean scale translates to a pretty uh, frequent rate of remating. Um, like I said, this gives us a sort of expectation for what we might see, provided we can look at these divergences, uh, which of course we can. Our comparison is going to be another species in the same genus, uh, Danis gilipus, the queen butterfly. So comparing that to the monarch, we'll get our divergences. But as I was saying uh, just a minute ago, divergence alone isn't really going to tell us much about selection. We also need sort of the other half of that equation. Uh, and we really need to know about the within species variation to look at the rate average that gets converted into between species fixed differences. Um, we can crunch all this down into this alpha statistic, which is an estimate of the rate or the proportion of substitutions that are fixed due to positive selection. Um, so a higher alpha means a greater proportion of fixed differences are due to selection. Um, there's obviously a lot of bioinformatics under the hood that goes into getting these quantities, but in the interest of time, we'll just skip the results. If you want to know, we can talk about it after. The so, um, like I said, we're going to start with the whole sperm proteome. Uh, that's going to be the guys in blue over here compared to the genome background, which is in white. So we do see off the bat um, this uptick in non-synonymous divergence, uh, but that also coincides with an uptick in synonymous divergence in the sperm proteome compared to the genomic background, leading us to see a sort of marginal increase in DNDS, um, not statistically significant, but a bit of a trend for higher divergence. But something else entirely is going on in polymorphisms. Uh, so within Monarchs, we see that there's sort of a dearth of non-synonymous polymorphisms in the sperm proteome. Uh, couple that with sort of equal rate of synonymous polymorphism between that and the genome background. And when you put all these things together, uh, we get a much higher uh, proportion of divergences that are fixed by selection. Uh, the error bars here are bootstrap confidence intervals. Um, and you can think of this sort of as the idea that there aren't that many more raw divergences that we're seeing, but because we're seeing so few non-synonymous polymorphisms, the ones that actually do make it through to fixed differences are likely driven by selection rather than drift. Um, so that's the sperm proteome as a whole. And when we split this apart, um, it's actually kind of disappointing. Uh, so we can see the same sort of pattern here uh, visible in the nucleated or eupyrene set. But we honestly can't really say that much about the apyrene or the nucleated set. And if you remember back to the sperm proteome slide, uh, there are many fewer unique proteins in that set. So this is really just sort of a lack of power here to get a good point estimate. So we can't say that much uh, using these data. But if you've been paying attention, maybe you're thinking that something isn't quite lining up here. Uh, you remember back to this. These were earlier innocent 
times a couple slides ago <laughs> when we made these predictions. Um, and we might expect to see increased rates of divergence, uh, and that divergence due to drift rather than selection, basically what this is saying. But we literally saw kind of the exact opposite of that. Uh, divergence wasn't that much higher, but what divergence we did see appeared to be the result of positive selection. So how do we reconcile these two? Uh, well, it turns out this curve up here applies to sperm competition alleles expressed in a diploid state. Um, but sperm are, of course, haploid in the end, and at least potentially can express things in a haploid state and experience haploid selection. So now when you're in the haploid selection world, um, selection is a lot more efficient. Uh, recessive deleterious variants are no longer hidden from selection. Um, and even if females aren't remating that frequently, if a male, say, heterozygous for some sperm competition, allele, then you can have within ejaculate competition between the two genotypes even. So maybe um, we're actually looking at something down here. Uh, I say maybe in part because these results are about five days old. Um, so this is very early days, but I'll note that it is consistent with our molecular predictions from this model and what we know about the um, mating behavioral biology of our system. So, one way I might feel a little bit better about this haploid selection story is basically to fill out more points on this curve to see if this continues to be consistent in other labs. So, I also did mention that there is one other sequence sperm proteome, and that's in the Carolina Sphinx moth, Manduca sexta. This is the guy that eats your tomatoes every summer. Um, and luckily for us, this is a highly monogamous species. So, um, we might actually predict that we see elevated rates of divergence in their sperm proteome, even if there is haploid expression and selection going on, just because sperm competition is almost never relevant in the species. So, um, almost directly after I leave this conference, uh, I'm gonna go out to the field to collect some more of these guys and do some sequencing and actually follow up on this. Um, but to just wrap up, and attempt to bring us back to the question of what's happening in annually sperm. I will say that it's possible that those molecular approaches 